salvation, the one who makes right all the wrongs that were done. Father, we beg your blessings on today's service and that we be uh, just humbled to receive your word and to receive it truthfully. Father, we ask that we also be empowered to live it out as we receive it. In Christ Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Bible, we see God using imperfect people for the sake of his mission. For the sake of bringing hope to a lost world. Listen, I, I never quite understood why Jesus chose the individuals that he did. But I'm guessing his reasoning was to further prove his validity of his being. He didn't call the popular he didn't call the rich. He didn't call the successful to further his ministry, but rather the poor, the broken, the faithful. Listen, I can only imagine how confused the Pharisees and religious leaders must have been while looking at the team of people the proclaimed Savior had gathered together. There were band of misfits. Yeah. 
They're a team of misfits with nothing to lose but everything to gain with God. From an outside perspective, we see that it didn't matter where people were, or where they were from, what they had done, or what, what they used to be. Jesus used all people for the good of his will. Listen, as we continue in our study of the Gospel of John, we will examine the second half of Christ's high priestly prayer. In the, in the first five verses of chapter 17, Jesus focused on his fulfillment of God's eternal plan. Now in the second half of the prayer, Jesus prays for his disciples. He prayed for the imp these imperfect men that were going to accomplish his mission. So if you would, please take your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter 17. We're going to begin in verses 6 and we're going to go through verse 19 as we examine distinctives of a true disciple. Distinctives of a true disciple. Begin with me in verse 6. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now, now they know this. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and I have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Verse 10. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are. Or one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them. I am not one of them, and not one of them has lost except the son of destruction. That the scripture might be fulfilled. Verse 13. But now I am going to you, and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Verse 15, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is true. As you sent me into the world, so have I sent them into the world. And for their sake I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in the truth. See, the first distinctive of a true disciple is a distinct selection. It's a distinct selection. In verse 6 we see the manifested selection. He says, I have manifested your name to the people whom you have gave me out of the world. Listen to this. Yours they were, and you gave them to me. And they have kept your word. Listen, the word manifest means this. It means to reveal. Yeah. It means to reveal. I, hey, man, I'm going to tell you, at Thanksgiving, when somebody brought out their turkey, guess what? They revealed it to you. <laughs> they kept it in the oven. Or maybe they fried it. I don't know. Maybe they smoked it. But when the time came, it was brought to the table. And you ate. It was revealed to you. Amen. Oh. What we see here is Jesus had revealed himself to his disciples. In other words, Jesus made God's name, that is the sum of his perfection, obvious and clear. Wow. We also see that this word is used in the past tense, which tells us that this was an accomplished fact. Get this, everything that Jesus said was what in the past tense. Why? Because it was an ordained, selected, predetermined 
fact. Wow. God's name encompasses all that he is, his character, his nature, and his attributes. Notice what he says when Jesus spoke, uh, verse 6, I manifested what? Your name. I manifested your name. In other words, he had manifested all of God's character to them. Hmm. Christ revealed that he is the Messiah, and in him all these qualities reside. Now listen, notice to whom Jesus revealed his name to. Notice this. Our text says that it was to those the Father had given him, his disciples. Jesus said the Father had gave them to him. Gave them. The word gave means to place, means to put. In other words, they had been selected. They had been slept, they had been given, they had been placed, they had put, they had been selected. It was not a roll of the dice by which the disciples revealed God's name, but it was a sovereign predetermined plan. In verse 4, Jesus had already indicated that it was his mission to make known the Father's name to the disciples. They had been selected, what? Out of the world, out of the world. Now, see, the word world speaks of the evil world system. Christ's disciples have been selected, what? Out of the world, out of the wicked world system, God chose to use these men. Notice that Jesus did not say that he had been selected in the world. Notice this, I love words. Notice this. Jesus did not say that he had been selected in the world but out of the world. Disciples were called to be different from the wicked world system. In the last half of verse 6, Jesus says, Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Once again, we see God's sovereign hand in his selection. Jesus said, Yours they were. Since the foundation of the world, his disciples had been chosen. And when the time came, they were given to Christ. Jesus also said that they had kept your word. That they had kept your word. This means that his disciples showed evidence of being selected by being obedient to God's call. These men had a desire to know and follow God's word. When Jesus said, follow me, they dropped everything. And what did they do? They followed him with complete abandonment. The disciples were among those who kept the word that had been revealed to them. From the heart, they responded in genuine faith the truth they had received. They did so because they had been chosen from eternity past. Oh, my friend, just look at people from whom God chose to reveal himself to. When Jesus prayed this prayer, his disciples were weak in their faith. The lesson we see in this verse is that Jesus sees more in his believing people than we see in ourselves or in themselves. Jesus can reveal himself, listen, to anyone he chooses. Amen. Has he revealed himself to you this morning? Has he revealed himself to you this morning? If he has, then my friends, listen to me. He can use you just like he used his band of misfit disciples. Amen. Not only do we see this manifested selection, but we see this knowledgeable selection. Verses 7 through 8, we read, Now they know that everything that you gave, you have given them, given me is from you, for I have given them the words that you gave me. And they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they believe that you sent me. Once again, we see Jesus referring to divine revelation. See, the only reason the disciples knew that Jesus was the Messiah was because God had revealed it to them. That's it. They were not forced to believe in Christ. Instead, it was through God's divine revelation that they desired to know and follow him. See, we see in these verses that Jesus emphasized God's word. He said, the words that what you gave me. I believe Jesus used this as a shorthand for the gospel. 
He said, the words that you gave me, I believe this is shorthand for, for, for Jesus saying, you have given the gospel. You gave me the words to say to reveal the message of the gospel. Hmm. Jesus shared the gospel with his disciples, and guess what? They believed it. They believed it. Here by no means was he saying that disciples had kept the law of Moses perfectly. None of them had kept all the Ten Commandments. However, they saw Christ as the perfect fulfillment of the law of Moses. See, we need to remember that the Mosaic law was given to show us our sin. It was something that we were never to live up to. We couldn't live up to it. Instead, when we know Jesus gave the Ten Commandments, He gave us His law so that we would see a mirror of our sin. We will see how flawed, how messed up we are and that we need a Savior. What we see in the Ten Commandments is the perfect character of an Almighty God. God knew that no one but Jesus could live up to the law. Through Jesus' proclamation of the Scriptures, the disciples saw themselves as incapable of living up to God's perfect standard. They saw themselves as sinners in need of a Savior. They did not come to this conclusion on their own. It was God who gave them this understanding. It was God who gave them knowledge to know that they were in desperate need of Jesus. My friends, knowledge is easy to come by in our world today. Hey, look, I guess one of the young ones probably got the phone. Guess what? You got knowledge right here at your hands. Yeah. And I got knowledge right here, man. I can get it as fast as I want. Yeah. I can find anything I want in a matter of seconds. My friends, listen, knowledge is pretty easy to come by. See, I know people who have read the Bible, man, they have read it backwards and forwards. But guess what? When they get done, they don't understand the liquor. Listen, all they're in search for is knowledge. They're not in search of any truth. They, they, all they want is something to scratch their intellect with. All my friends, for those who have been selected, chosen by God, they will receive not only knowledge, but they will understand who Jesus is and what he has done. Amen. A true disciple will understand his sin and he will understand his need for a Savior. It is God giving you knowledge and understanding of who He is this morning? Is He telling you this morning, listen, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. If He is, then my friends, guess what? You're He's starting to reveal Himself to you because you cannot come to that conclusion on your own. Is He calling you out to be you? Not only do we See the manifested selection, the knowledgeable selection, but next we see the appointed selection. In verses 9 through 10, we read, I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Is it not amazing that Jesus prayed for his disciples? How good is not That Jesus prayed for a bunch of misfits. What an encouragement this must have been for, for these 11, 11 men. In their weakness and sorrow, guess what? He prayed for them. We see once again, Jesus said, those whom you have given me. This tells us that God appointed these disciples, what? For his work. Just think about the kind of dudes these were. Think about the kind of people Jesus was praying for. They were fishermen, tax collectors, tradesmen, zealots. These were not the best the world had to offer. If you're picking out a people to start a revolution, this wasn't going to be it. However, these were the men that God chose to turn the world upside down with. Notice that Jesus did not pray for the world. He didn't pray for the world. He was praying for his disciples who would be left in the world. 
He says, I'm fixing to go to the cross. Got to remember within just a few hours, Jesus was going to be uh, betrayed. He was going to be crucified. And he was going to be put in a grave. And Jesus was not thinking about the torment that he was going to be going through. He wasn't complaining to the Father. What did he do? He was being the humble servant that he is. And he was praying for others. And he was serving others. Notice that Jesus did not pray for the world. He was praying for his disciples who would be left in the world to do his work. He said, I am glorified in them. Think about this. A bunch of misfits. A bunch of nobodies. A bunch of people that the world wouldn't look at and go, ooh. He looked at them and went, I don't want them. Mm -hmm. That's what the world would look at. See, oh man. You see, in our church world today, there are many people who are not accepted within the local church because they don't fit the type they want. Mm -hmm. They don't fit the type. Yes, sir. <laughs> they don't drive the right car. Mm -hmm. They don't have the right social economical background. Mm. They don't look like the kind of person they want. Now, if there was a church here in town to make it a little bit more, more at home, it happened here in our own county. Now, I'm not going to name 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 of the church, but it was here. And there was a a man who got up in the pulpit. He was a visiting preacher, and he began to proclaim the gospel. And buddy, he, he left no stone uncovered. And at the end of that service, this was a very, how shall I say, I would call high church. When I say high church, this is the people that had that dressed everybody dressed in their nice clothes. They they everything looked, looked like they were in the right place. And this was like the church everybody would kind of want to be part of because this is happening, this is where everybody went. Everybody in town went. Everybody who was somebody went to this church. And this man began to preach. And there was a woman who came to church that Sunday, and guess what she was? She was known as one of the biggest prostitutes in this town. Hmm. She heard the gospel message. And it's before that man could ever give the invitation, she ran down to the altar and grabbed that man's hand and said, I want to be saved. But everybody looked at that woman in disgust. Nobody would go down and pray with her. Nobody wanted to touch her. No one wanted to hug her. Because she didn't fit the type of person they wanted. <coughs> and I'm going to tell you what that preacher did. He called them out. He saw what was going on. And he looked and he pointed out to the congregation. And he said, how dare you? I saw you come up here and pray for the person who was put together. It looked like it was put together, right? I saw you come down here and pray for the person who had the nice car, the nice house, all the right stuff. He said, but you wouldn't pray for this person right here. Mm. How dare you? He said, there's some people who need to get their heart right in this church. Amen. That's right. Well, instead of inviting the man back from the church, they went back to that church to speak and never asked him back again. Because he called them on what they were. My friends, listen to me. God can save anybody you want. Amen. Amen. He don't matter what they look like, where they come from. God can, God can save anybody. That's right. Mm -hmm. God can save anybody. I remember telling Chris Allman this this morning. One of the desires of my church, of planning a church here, is I want people who come here, to anybody, I don't care what you look like, what kind of background you come from, I don't care. I don't care. I want people to be able to come in and hear the truth of the gospel and let God change them. Amen. And when they walk in the door, I want people to know that they're loved. Amen. Amen. That they're loved and they care about. My friends, that's what the church is called out to be. 
My friends, look at who Jesus called. He called a bunch of band of misfit disciples. Mm -hmm. he, he called out the people the Pharisees didn't want to touch. In fact, what did Jesus say? He said, uh, the Pharisees, the, these legalists, these religious crowd looked at Jesus and said, why do you hang out with sinners? Why do you hang out with people? Man, we don't want to touch them. We don't want anything to do with them. Those are the very people Jesus went to. Yeah. Oh, my friend. He has called us. He has called us. He, he wants to use a bunch of misfit people for his glory. For his glory. Look at what Jesus said. He said, I am glorified in them. I'm glorified in them. These bunch of what the world looks like as useless people, Jesus said, I'm glorified in them. Amen. That blows my mind. Mm. Jesus knew that they would scatter in fear. He'd already told them, said, listen, I know these 11 guys. I know what's going to happen to them. They're going to scatter in fear. As soon as these men, I, they come and take me away. And as soon as they put me on the cross, guess what? They're all going to be gone home. They're going to scatter and they're going to be gone. Jesus knew what was going to happen. But he also knew that after his resurrection and ascension, they would accomplish their mission. Mm -hmm. He says, I know you're going to have to grow in your faith. I know there's some things you're going to have to learn on the way. In other words, guess what? Whenever you get saved, you're not perfect. That's right. There's a lot of growing you got to do. If you want to be a true disciple of God, remember this. You will always, for eternity, be a disciple. Amen. You will never have it all together. You will never have it all together. There's going to be times whenever we were just like these disciples, and guess what we do? We scatter. We've walked away. We've gotten, we, we, we've gotten, we've cowered down in fear. But as we grow in who God is, and we grow in who He is, as we grow in the power of the Holy Spirit, we realize that we can go out the more we're able to step out in faith. Let ourselves die and let Him be glorified. Amen. Listen, Christ was going to be glorified despite the flaws and failures of his disciples. That's right. These men were appointed for the purpose of what? God's glory. Mm -hmm. My friends, listen to me. Why did God save these bunch of misfit people? For his glory. For his glory. My friends, this is why he has selected us. This is why he has chosen us. He has called us out what? for his glory. He wants his glory to shine to every area of our lives. His glory is to shine uh, at, at our homes, at our jobs, in our community. We have been appointed to shine God's glory, what? To the very ends of the earth. The first distinctive of a true disciple was selection. Now the second distinctive of a true disciple is perseverance. In verse 11 through 12, we see a watchful perseverance. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. What did Jesus mean when he said that he was no longer in the world? He was once again speaking of his future in heaven. He was talking about his future glory. He, he, he was talking about the accomplishment of the cross. In verse 1, Jesus said, the hour has come. He was saying, I know I will be in heaven, but my disciples will still be living in this wicked world. Jesus specifically had his disciples in mind in this prayer. He did not pray in a general sense for the world. Instead, Jesus prayed for the disciples who would carry his message of love and redemption to the world. Jesus addressed God as what? Holy Father. This is the title. This is the title of God that you won't find anywhere else in the scripture. Holy Father. He was reminding his disciples of what God's holy. 
God's holiness. Jesus used this title for God to set the stage for the rest of the dissection, which targets the holiness of his disciples. In other words, I, I, Jesus is saying, I'm sending you out. You are my misfits. You are my disciples. I'm using you for your glory. And because I am using you for your glory, for, for my glory, uh, I, I, I'm going to make you holy. Mm. You're going to be set apart. Jesus used this title for God to set the stage to proclaim to his disciples, not only, not only have I chosen you, not only have I selected you, but I'm going to make you holy. These were unholy men, but through the Son, they had been brought into a purifying relationship with God. He had set them apart. Jesus prayed that God would what? Keep them. Keep them. I'm going to wait to tell you this. If this word won't make you get happy, it makes me happy. Notice this. Oh, I love the word keep. I love the word keep in the scriptures. I'm going to wait to tell you this. When we see the word keep, you know what it means? It means to be his. Yeah, that's right. It means to be his. What happens when you keep something? It's yours. It's yours. I'm keeping this. It's mine. <laughs> the word keep in the Greek means to watch over. It means to guard. To be kept is to be protected and to be preserved. In number 624, we see the words of the great priestly blessing. He says, the Lord bless what and keep you. Those who are truly saved are what? Kept. They're kept. This means that they cannot be taken away. They belong to God forever. It is God who keeps them. They cannot keep themselves. It is God who keeps those who believe. He keeps them tight in the palm of his hands. Jesus also prayed that his disciples may be one, even if, even as we are one. The disciples were not unified at this time. In fact, what we see in the scriptures is that these band of misfits were quite ununified. They, they were fighting over who would be first in the kingdom of God, who would sit beside Jesus. They were, they were, they were, so who, who will sit next to me and who will sit next to you in your kingdom? Th these people were interested in prestige. They were interested in an earthly kingdom. They were not unified. Hmm. Jesus had already told them that they would scatter to their own home. These were men who argued about, the, about who, the, who, who, who would sit beside Jesus in his kingdom. He was praying for their spiritual maturity. He was praying that the Father bind believers together so they could enjoy the same kind of oneness shared by the person of the Trinity. In verse 12, Jesus said, While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. So the disciples had walked with Jesus, what, for three years? For three years. He had taught them, empowered them, and shielded them from attacks. When Jesus was watching them, he preserved them. Jesus said that he had lost none of them except the son of perdition or the son of destruction, which was Judas. Let's get this straight. Judas was not a believer. Let's go ahead and set that right. In fact, Jesus calls Judas a devil. The only reason that Judas was numbered among the twelve was so, the, so that the scriptures may be fulfilled. This shows us that God only watches and keeps who is he. Mm. Listen, are you struggling in your faith this morning? Let me remind you this morning that we serve a God who keeps you. Amen. If you belong to him, he will hold on to you. He will hold you right in the palm of his hands. If he holds the whole world in his hands, he holds you in his hand. He will watch over you. He will protect you. You will persevere. Your faith may be weak at times, but you'll get through it because he keeps you. Because he keeps you. Not only do we see a watchful perseverance, but we also see the joyful perseverance 
In verses 13 and 16 we read, But now I am going to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Jesus began by saying, These things I speak in the world. The fact that Jesus was praying in front of his disciples, asking God to keep them, I don't know about you, must have brought some level of joy. These bunch of people who were ununified, bunch of social outcasts, and Jesus was praying that they may have his joy. Oh, my friend. That must have been a little bit of an encouragement to them, which hey, would encourage me. It was in this prayer that his disciples saw the depth of love he had for them. Notice that Jesus said, my joy. He didn't say, I joy. He said, I want you to have my joy. Mm -hmm. I joy. Jesus didn't want his disciples just to have any happiness he, they wanted. He wanted, he wanted them to have his joy. Think about this for a minute. Jesus was about to be put on trial, beaten, and put on the cross. Yeah. And Jesus prayed that his disciples have his joy. The only way his disciples could experience the joy of Christ in this world is through Christ's suffering on the cross. Christ's joy was fulfilled in them after his resurrection and ascension. His joy indwelled them when they were filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Jesus had prepared his disciples for this joy by giving them God's word. He told them that this was going to happen. However, this joy came with a price. He had already told them that if they hated me, they would hate you. If they persecuted me, they would persecute you. This evil world system will never know the joy of the Lord because they have rejected God's word. However, the only reason that disciples would receive this joy is because they believed and accepted God's word. They had been called to live in the world, but not of the world. This is what Jesus meant when he prayed that his disciples not be taken out of the world. Instead, he prayed that they be kept what from the evil one. Oh man, this is good prayer. That they be kept from the evil one. There's nothing that Satan would like to do to destroy saving faith. He would love to destroy your saving faith. Mm -hmm. There's nothing better he'd like to do than to make you unsaved. Mm -hmm. But guess what? I told you I love this word keep. Mm -hmm. The word keep. The word keep is a definite. In other words, when Jesus keeps you, nothing can take it away. Mm -hmm. He keeps. There is nothing that Satan would like to do to destroy saving faith. Oh, my friend, Jesus prayed that the Father would keep them. My friends, do you think that God the Son could pray to God the Father and God would listen? Guess what Jesus did? Jesus prayed with complete uh, 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 unity with God the Father. Why? Because they are one. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three in one. So there, it's impossible for them to be in disunity with one another. So what do we know? Jesus prayed in the Father's will because the Father knew he was going to keep them. That's right. It was a death. Nothing could take them away. In other words, he's saying this, and no matter what the devil throws at you, you're mine. No matter what Satan may try to do in your life, nothing can change the fact that I am keeping you. Mm. Love that word, keep. Jesus does not pray for anything outside the Father's will. See, the Lord's intercession for his people guarantees that none of them will be reclaimed by Satan. My friends, once you belong to Jesus, you are his. Amen. Amen. 
In verse 16, we see something really cool. Jesus said this, they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. I love this. This is good. This is more than just a restatement. More than just a restatement. It's a reiteration by the Son before the Father of the unity that he shares with those left in the world. Both Christ, oh, this is good. Both Christ and his disciples this ain't their home. They have a home in heaven. This world is not my home. We're just passing through. Both have work to do in this world and both have a home in glory. As believers, we can share the joy of the Lord. Life is not going to get easier in this world. Jesus told his disciples that they will have tribulations. Listen, for the believer, life is going to be hard. In fact, we live in a world that everything that a Christian tries to say and proclaim in this world, people are going to hate and despise. That's right. The world will not like what we have to say or what we stand for. However, through it all, we will be given the supernatural joy of Christ. It is a joy that can look death in the face and rejoice. The same joy that Jesus had when looking at the cross he gives to his believers. We can face death with joy. Mm. The first distinctive of a true disciple is selection. The second distinctive of a true disciple is perseverance. Now the third distinctive of a true disciple is approval. It's approval. In verse 17 we see Sanctifying approval. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. Jesus had already prayed for his father what to keep his disciples. Mm -hmm. Now he was praying for the father what to sanctify and purify his disciples. Listen to me. If you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, a true disciple of Jesus Christ, there will be sanctification in your life. Mm -hmm. Notice this. If there is no sign of sanctification in your life, you're not in. In other words, what is God going to do? He's going to continually change you. And guess what you're going to look like? I don't want to look like Wilson more next year. I don't want to look like Wilson more tomorrow or the next hour, the next minute. I want to look more like Jesus. That's what sanctification means. It means becoming more like Christ. And listen, only those who know Jesus Christ will be sanctified. Jesus didn't pray this prayer just to anyone. He prayed, he prayed this prayer. He said, sanctify them only to those who believe. To those who believe. Listen, the devil gets blamed for a lot of stuff. But actually, it is the simple heart of man that is blamed. Just because we are Christians doesn't mean that we are not tempted by the flesh. The disciples were no different. They were human just like us. They were tempted with everything the world had to offer. Jesus therefore asked his Father what to sanctify them. Sanctify them what? In truth, to set them apart from sin. The only way the disciples could face the temptation of this world is if they had become more like Christ. They had to be what? Sanctified. Sanctification is the process in which God begins to show us our sin so that sin might be put to death in our lives. It is through the process of sanctification that proves to the world that we belong to Him. Amen. The instrument of God's sanctification is what? It's His Word. Listen, if you don't believe this book is God's infallible Word of God, guess what? You ain't going to get sanctified. If you don't believe that this is God's word breathed out, you're not going to be sanctified. God uses the scriptures, his written word, for us to be sanctified. That's right. Hmm. Hebrews 4.12 tells us, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the vision of soul and the spirit of joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God's word, what? I guess it does two things. 
It offends and it defends. Mm -hmm. What's a two-edged sword do? It can cut both ways. Mm -hmm. God's word will defend us, but guess what it also will do? It's going to offend us. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad, I'm going to tell you, I'm glad the word of God offends me. Amen. I'm glad it offends me. Mm -hmm. But it calls me, shows me how wicked I am and how good he is. Mm hmm. Mm. Listen, God's word cuts to the very heart of what a sinner is in need of. We're in need of a Savior. Mm -hmm. When God shows us our mess, is his way of saying, let me clean you up. And my friend, listen to me. If you read God's word and you read it, you understand it, and you're starting to see some things in it, then guess what that is? It is not you are not understanding. It is God revealing you. And when God reveals it to you, guess what he's saying? He said, all right, let me clean it up. Let me fix it. Because you can't do it. Sanctification. My friends, it was through God's sanctification that the disciples were able to face the world with boldness and he was praying for them he said listen to them he was praying for them to be sanctified listen these were a bunch of weak misfit these were a bunch of uh, outcast human beings and God was sitting there saying I know the world ain't going to understand it God sanctify them. Mm -hmm. make them look more like me that's what Jesus was saying mm -hmm. this a true disciple will be a student of God's word he will have a desire to read and study the scriptures. He will want to live those truths out in his life. People will see the sanctification of Christ in their life. The sin he wants, they once loved, will be removed. See, the world will, the world will see a person who is being made holy. That's what Jesus was praying for his disciples. He says, I want this lost world to see a bunch of holy people. I want them to see a, I want them to see people who look like me. And listen, listen to this. If if we are staying in our sin, living in our sin, doing the same old thing, doing what we know is right, but yet putting our fist in the face of God and listen to me, God's not going to He's not sanctified. Mm -hmm. But if Christ is showing you your sin, saying this is what we need to get rid of in our life, this is what we need to do to purge, and you can look more like me, if he is showing that to you, then guess what? You're his. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, get rid of it so you can be more like me. Mm -hmm. Not only do we see the sanctified approval, but lastly, we see the sin approval. In verses 18 through 19, we read, And you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for her sake, I consecrated myself, and they also may be sanctified, what in truth. Mm -hmm. My friends, only sanctified believers are ready to be sent into the world. Mm -hmm. In other words, guess what? The only people who ever have any business going on a mission trip, I'll be honest with you, like, like going overseas and doing ministry, are people who've been sanctified. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you have no story to tell, there's nothing you can do. Yeah. If you don't have any story to tell, there's nothing you can do. Only sanctified believers are ready to be sent into the world as the Father sent Christ into the world. This, but my friends, this is a preview of the Great Commission. He would give his disciples after his resurrection. Having been set apart from the world and transformed by grace, the disciples would be heralds for the same grace to the very, uh, very world that hated them. In the same way that they're disciples of Jesus that were to make disciples of Christ, what to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things, all command, all commanded them. Just as Jesus had been sent into the world by the Father, so now the disciples are being sent to the world by Jesus. Listen, through their witness, the world would be exposed to the gospel, and many would come to saving faith. When you look at these bunch of band and misfit disciples, this bunch of outcasts, at this point, you would look at them and go, Nope. Yeah. <laughs> Nah. 
You must have a different group of 11. Uh, they're hidden disciples somewhere that we don't know about. Because this can't be the group that God's going to use. This can't be it. Can't be it. But God was sending, he was preparing them to go into the world and share the gospel and turn this world upside down for his glory. Why? Through their witness, the world will be exposed to the gospel and many would come to saving faith. However, none of this would take place without Christ going to the cross. And that's what Jesus said. He says, and for their sake, I consecrate myself that they may be sanctified in truth. For the disciples' sake, Jesus was sanctified himself. He would set himself apart to righteously obey the Father's will by what? Dying on the cross. This is the only way we can be sanctified is through the cross. It was only because he atoned for their sins that they themselves also would be sanctified in truth. This is having been justified through faith in him, they would, they would be daily conformed into the image of their Savior. Listen, a true disciple will not be able to keep the good news of the gospel to themselves. That's right. Listen, you may start off a little weak, but you'll grow. Aren't you glad God uses weak people? Amen. Amen. I'm glad God can use weak people. He will be a person that takes the gospel seriously. A true disciple will take the message of what has changed them, and he will take it seriously. Listen, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then guess what? You've been sent this morning. You have not been sent into the world to proclaim, you have been sent into the world to proclaim uh, uh, God's message. Listen, you have not been sent into the world to proclaim God's gospel because you have been approved. Not because you've met God's approval. Aren't you glad that God didn't send? Disciples into, into the world based on a criteria that they met. They didn't need it. Amen. They didn't need it. This, you have been sitting into the world because Christ met the Father's approval. You couldn't meet any type of approval. God, Jesus met God the Father's approval and he went to the cross. We are not approved by our own standards, by our own performance, by our own goodness. Mm -hmm. We're approved because of what Christ has done on the cross. Mm -hmm. That's right. This morning we've examined distinctness of true disciples. Listen, do any of these distinctives match your life? That's what I'm asking you. Do, do these distinctives match your life? Maybe God is working on your heart this morning. If he is showing these things, that look, none of this matches who I am. It doesn't match anything in my life. What you're saying, I, I don't see it. It's not active in my life. I don't know. If, you, if, if you're coming to that realization and listen to this, it is God, the Holy Spirit, revealing that to you in your heart. If you're saying, I don't meet any of these distinctions. And listen to me, that's God working in your heart, showing you that you need Him. Mm -hmm. Maybe you feel like you aren't worthy enough to be used by God, let alone be loved by Him. Listen, just remember that Jesus used a bunch of flawed people to share the hope to a flawed, broken world. Mm -hmm. In God, we find renewal, men, we find purpose. Jesus didn't call the equipped. Notice that. Jesus didn't call the equipped. He equipped the call. It is God that made his disciples distinct in the world. My friends, listen to this. He can do the same for you this morning. He can call you out and he can make you distinct. Be a distinct disciple. He can use anybody he wants to use. It doesn't matter. Last week, 
we had us a young lady after church come up to me and I'm she'll be here probably next week and uh, I think it's safe to say that she probably has some autism and she came up to me after church last week and she told me she says I know I'm not good enough See, a lot of folks in this world look at somebody who struggles with issues like autism, fill in the blank. And I hate to say this, but there are many places around this county that wouldn't give them the time of day. Let's be honest. That little girl wanted to know Jesus. And she did. She did. She says, I know I'm not. God can use anybody. He can reveal truth to anyone. Anyone he chooses. He can save anyone. There's a young man, and uh, some of y'all know who I'm talking about. I know Chuck knows who I'm talking about. I uh, think Dink Sasser uh, from Stabber in Norwood. Norwood uh, Dink was known as uh, a drug addict and alcoholic. And and that, that was routine in his family. Routine in his family. And honestly, people looked at Dink, and I didn't look at him, myself included, and go, hey, I just think he's going to be that way for the rest of his life. I'm going to tell you what happened to Dink. Dink got hurt here at the gospel. A few weeks ago, he got baptized. He was a man that everybody looked at and went, eh, we're done. Ain't nothing to change him. My friend, listen to me. God can change who he wants. That's right. He can save who he wants. Amen. And he can do what he wants to with anybody he chooses to. Amen. He's God, we're not. Amen. He's God, we're not. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, God, we love you. Lord, we thank you for calling us out. Lord, we ain't nothing but a bunch of misfits. We ain't nothing but a bunch of outcasts. God, you choose to. Oh, God, we thank you for that. Lord, it's none of our own doing. If we could, we would boast about it. Lord, you've done it all. You saved it. It's your work. Lord, you revealed it to us. Lord, thank you for making us disciples. Lord, thank you for giving us a home in glory. Lord, help us to go out this week and, 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 and to shine your light into our world, into our community. Lord, that we have been sent. You have sent us. And Lord, we love you. And in your precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.